long ago we actually established circulating beams. So this is this is already really good. I mean, circulating beam in the sense of that the beam is actually making a few turns um, in the SPS. Um, so it, it took a while because we had an issue at, uh, in a transfer from the PS, so our pre-injector. I'm pointing that direction because there are colleagues in the PS they're working on that side. Um, and uh, so we didn't actually manage it, manage it through one of the magnets that is um, bending the beam off uh, from what is called TT2 transfer line into the uh, SPS injection line, which is called TT10. Um, and uh, for whatever reasons, it is, it, it is new, which was refurbished. Um, uh, it, it didn't have the right calibration. So this was sorted out, took the entire morning, if you want. And only actually after lunch, um, uh, we, 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 we scanned much further than we would normally do. So we changed essentially the strength of this magnet by more than 50% in the end, I think. Um, and um, yeah, then we made it all the way to just the SPS, the injection equipment. Thank you for having us here. This is your Welcome place. to you all. We've occupied it, but it's Star Wars Day, and this is a Star Wars place. We couldn't be not here. This is even better than Star Wars. This is real life. Look at it. This is the next next generation of amplifiers, RF amplifiers you have here with the solid state technology. This is really fantastic and part of it. Yes, indeed. Exactly. That's why the first attempt makes you a, bit, a little bit nervous, right? Yes, but we're confident. It should be okay. We will be part of it and we'll be ready for the first acceleration. Of is there been one night? Yes, this is this is on coming, coming on. Yeah. So, uh, Charles, uh, you yes. you are here um, all the time. You're on shift. Yeah. Are you the guy who's gonna power the the SCS uh, radio frequency cavity, or what, what is your job? Uh, my job is uh, to work in the amplifier principal okay. uh, in the, the amplifier. So the, these are the amplifiers? This you have the solid state and you have the tetrod. You have the not the same generation. You have Here you have the new RF technology. RF, so this is the keyword today, radio frequency. This is something that uh, we actually use in our daily life in hospitals for the nuclear magnetic resonance. I just want to remind that uh, our first electric general Felix Block got the Nobel Prize in 1962 for uh, inventing the nuclear magnetic resonance. So what comes out of accelerating new drugs for pure science, but also for medical projects? Yes, indeed. Eric, so yeah. can you tell us how does an RF work? What it is? What's the principle of the RF? So, if you look at the cavity you have on the screen, the beams are passing through the, the, the cavities. Here we put some colors in order to help to understand what happened. Let's imagine we have protons that are in red. So when they are coming to the cavity, we put in front of them uh, opposite fields. They are accelerated, passing through the cavity. We change uh, the, the inside the cavity. This is exactly what is doing radio frequency. So the radio frequency uh, frequency is calculated such that the time of flight of the particles inside the cavity corresponds exactly to the swap of the field that we apply to the particles. This is a single point in the machine and the particles are in a circular machine in this specific SPS. They are turning all around and they are coming in the cavity, single place here in BA3 
every uh, uh, 23 microseconds, 43,000 times a, a second. Second, they get the kick and the they get a kick. Simple, the principle. It's simple to say, but of it's simple to say. To do. Yeah. Basically, a proton is a positively charged particle. It's attracted by a positive charge, and then you just swap the charge. Yes. It becomes negative, it kicks it out. And you do it several times until we reach close to the speed of light, because that's the ring where we reach close to the speed of light. Right. This is it. Okay, this looks simple, but it can be explained in a simple way with the this. SCS. This is also an SCS. Yep. It's a super classic synchrotron. I feel like that's like a third guest. Martin Sonnen. Hi, Martin. Hello. You're an RF expert. Uh, you uh, work at CERN. Yes, you uh, this, exactly. What's your normal job? This so, was a hobby. Yes, I so guess. my normal job is a computer scientist here at CERN, where I develop acquisition systems for the different accelerators. But uh, as for, for the CERN Open Days two years ago, we built a minor particle accelerator um, such that we can show people how they work in a simple way. So this has the same basic components as, uh, as a normal accelerator. We have cavities, just like in the SPS. We have injectors that help bend the beam into the beam pipe. We have extractors that help us uh, bend the particles out of the beam pipe. And to give the particles an initial push, we have a linear accelerator. So in this case, we're using gravity to give our magnetic balls, which is our uh, replacement for the charged particles in the SPS. So I'm going to show you how we can run a full beam cycle in this accelerator. Yes, please. So the first step we need to do is that we need to make sure that the machine is in a good state. So first, I will make sure that the injector is where it should be. So now it's in the position to inject. The extractor is now in a placement such that we can uh, have the particles go around. Now I'm going to drop a ball into our beam pipe. Uh, here we have the protons. Ah. And now, injected into the beam pipe. now we have a particle injected into our linear, into our accelerator. Now, the next step is to accelerate them. So I'm going to start increasing the voltage in our cavities. So slowly and slowly, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but maybe you can hear it, that the speed of the particles, um, which uh, unfortunately stopped in the machine somewhere. And unfortunately, so <laughs> yes. Uh, so unfortunately, things happened and you sometimes need a uh, Manual intervention. Oh. Actually, I see the uh, I see our particle right here. There's your particle. So I'm going you to. Kicked the magnet. I kicked it with a magnet to give it a, a little push, just to, such that we can keep accelerating so it. Circulating. Now it's circulating again. So I'm gonna. Yes. So now it's accelerated at full energy. So normal in the SPS, what we would do is that we would extract it into either a fixed experiment or into the LHC. Uh, we don't have a fixed experiment or we don't have a bigger accelerator right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to extract it back into our linear accelerator. Which is also what happens in the real machine because every 10 hours you renew the beam. So you uh, have to dump them. Yeah, yeah. So in the real machine, if we don't use the beam, we have to dump it. Yes. Sorry. So I'm going to synchronize manually with the extractor. And now I have injected, uh, extracted the particles out of our small uh, SPS. Fantastic. Thank you, Martin. Ah, you're you quite can welcome. Say, you can say some questions. I'll call back uh, Eric uh, uh, here with me. Thank you. Thank so you So we can now view the process in the graphic and understand better what happens to the particle, just uh, as a summary. Yes. Um, yes, means uh, the animation. Uh, so particles are uh, made from a bottle of hydrogen. Uh, you in this case, we're using protons, but there are many more. Uh, many more, yes. Yes. So, can you go ahead and explain this? So, the protons are in the machine. They are in the PS. They will be extracted from the PS and then sent to the SPS. They are accelerated. Then they come in the SPS, and as we said, we have one place with the radio frequency system, the cavities in the machine, and they are passing through the cavities every turn, and we give this kick of acceleration every turn. Here, you have the magnets that are keeping them in the machine. And once they are accelerated enough, 
they will then be injected into the LHC. And that's the role of the SPS. A second one is to have fixed target program and uh, various other programs where we have the own SPS program yeah, for... for that, so the LHC is not ready for the moment. Uh, it's going not to yet. Uh, undergoing uh, uh, a lot of improvements. And uh, it's going to get uh, its beams in the opposite direction so from two transfer lines uh, in September for the first time. In the meantime, the fixed target experiment that you mentioned are, uh, are quite uh, getting ready and anxious to get beams. And uh, we will, uh, yeah, and we, and we will see that in a moment we have physicists from the SES. But we mentioned the force, RF. Yes. Radio frequency is the force. And uh, we went a few days ago with Christina, one colleague of mine, right in the tunnel, taking the opportunity of a three-day technical stop with another colleague of yours, Julia Papotti, radio frequency engineer. Let's take a look at what they look like. This, uh, this magic, uh, magic uh, components that are powered by, by your magic boxes. Thank you. Julia, uh, can you explain what do we have here and how does it work? Um, what we have here is one spare of uh, one spare component of the traveling way structures that we use for acceleration at the SPS. So, in fact, this small section is what we call the accelerating cavity. So, it's here that we can apply an electromagnetic field to the beam so that the beam loses its, its, its energy. Um, what we have is that there's 11 of these cavities in one module and what we have assembled down in the tunnel, as I said, this is a spare, the actual stuff that is working is downstairs in the tunnel and what we have is assembled three of these pieces or four of these pieces into one big uh, structure. What has changed from previous runs concerning these modules at least? The main difference is that they were rearranged differently in the tunnel. So we used to have longer structures, so four of these modules or five of these modules assembled in one block to create one big accelerating structure. And what we did was we now have six of these structures which are shorter. So we have four structures made of three modules of these and two structures made of four of these. So the idea is that um, for the beams that we need to provide to the high luminosity LHC, so the upgrade of the LHC, um, what we have to do is um, basically accelerate bunches, so packets of um, protons that contain many more protons. So we have to have about twice as many protons per packet. Because of that, we need um, to have more accelerating voltage applied from these structures. And one of the ways of doing that more efficiently is to get shorter structures in the tunnel. So that's why. The additional thing is that we needed more power, more total power to be applied to the beam. So what we did is we went from four power plants to six power plants. What do you expect with these upgrades? What we're hoping for is to, what we're aiming at, is to be able to accelerate these much more intense uh, proton bunches for use at the high luminosity LHC. So one of the key characteristics is that you want more protons per packet so that when the packets get to the LHC, you can have more collisions because there's more protons there, really. For example, at the SPS, we'll still be accelerating from 26 GeV over C, over C to 450 GeV over C, but it's just that they will be more dense. So once they get to the LHC and they will be squeezed at the, at the interaction point to get collisions, collisions will be more likely because there will be more protons that can collide. Okay, thank you. that there is a beam in the SPS, a stable beam, and they are now going to accelerate. So let's not waste time and go to Ron Sauterbach, our colleague in the SPS control room. Ron, over to you. What's happening? Thank you, Paula. Okay, yeah, they, uh, they're managing to uh, accelerate the beam. So um, with that, I will show you quickly uh, the, the dashboard of the SPS, and then we arrive at the, at the operator that will explain everything. Okay? So we start here with a map of the SPS, and this is the map for the access system. So here we have the list of all the points where the people can enter. 
the, the, the next screen is the, the vacuum screen. We can see the vacuum in the beam lines. Okay, and then we continue by the hardware system of the of the access system. So here with the real buttons and keys, we can put the machine in beam mode or in access mode. Then we arrive here at the display with the, the main power supplies. And this is the control of the main power supplies. And now to the, the left of there, you see the green boxes. This is the control uh, interface for the radio frequency system. And that's, of course, the system where you are there with your platform. And now we move over to the orbit. And now we move over to Eric. And he's the operator of the SPS. And he Hi. will ex uh, explain and show uh, how we accelerate the beam. Eric. Yeah, so here you can see on the screen. Actually, the beam is accelerating until flat top. This is the scale. Here is a magnetic field where the energy is ramping up. And, uh, okay, and what is your main uh, job here in the control room? What is your daily task? Uh, so we are sure that uh, everything is fine. So here you can see actually that something is, is not good. So we are working uh, hard to, to fix. Actually, we pause during the acceleration. And the main job is to keep it... Uh, okay, and then if I go a little bit down, we see the, the red button. Yes. And so what is this? Can you explain this to me? So in case of emergency, emergency uh, the operator can, can stop the beam. The beam. Uh, and, and stop, stop all the beam, beam until he uh, okay. okay, I think, I think uh, this is a good point to go back to Paula. Oh, yes, I am, of course, of course. No, I was nervous, of course, indeed, but, but it's fantastic. Very well done. I still encourage everyone to send your questions to our magic social um, uh, media management team. In the meantime, we've we'll talked about extracting the beam to the LHC with two transfer lines, but we also mentioned, and you've seen them in the list of experiments that are served by the SES, names like Compass, NA61, NA62, NA64. We have, of course, interviewed physicists from those experiments who were also as nervous as you because yeah, they yeah, need that beam <laughs> to do their experiments. And uh, uh, the first we are going to take a look at is NA61 Shine, when my colleague Craig was a few days ago with Boyce Brilinski from NA61 Shine experiment. So thank you, Paula. We are here in the north area of CERN, and I'm currently joined by Wojciech from the NA61 experiment. NA61 takes proton beams from the SPS and uses them for a range of fixed target experiments. So what is NA61 and how does it use these beams? Uh, NA61 Shine is a SPS heavy ion and neutrino experiment. As, as you mentioned, it is the fixed target experiment. So with, with the beam coming from SPS, we hit the target. We, we have the, intro, the interaction on, on the target, and then we can measure inside our spectrometer the, the shower of, of produced particles. Or to, to study heavy ion physics, we, we collide in front of the north area, we, we collide the beam from SPS with, with some secondary target, and then we can select the produced fragments or particles which comes to, to our experiment. So Obviously, there's a range of beams are used. So what, what is the main goal for the experiment? NA61 Shine has a very broad physics program, starting from heavy ion physics, finishing at and the reference measurements for the neutrino and cosmic ray experiments. And from the point of view of heavy ion physics, we want to study the phase transition between the normal matter that, that we can observe in, in real life and the quark gluon plasma. The energy range that SPS can provide us allows us to, to study uh, different types of collisions with, with different types of particles colliding with different types of gets. So we can measure in, in which collisions the quark gluon plasma is created and where, when the quark gluon plasma is not created to better understand like, all the properties of, of the space transition. So we're coming up to the end of Long Shutdown 2 in preparation for Run 3 of the Large Hadron Collider. So what has N61 been doing in the three years since the last beam? Yeah, actually we, we had a quite major upgrade of, of our facility. 
the main point is to increase the data taking rate. So, so thanks, to, thanks to the upgrade, we will be able to take the data 10 times faster. So thank you very much for being with us, White Check. Well, now we'll go back to Paola in the CCC, and we'll be back later in the North area to interview someone from the Compass experiment. Thank you. Have fun. Bye-bye. And that was Fred and Wojciech in the North area at the NA61 Shine experiment. Uh, just uh, to tell you the difference Hello. between, between uh, synchrotrons and collider. Yes, yes, it's a synchrotron, right? Yes. Because yeah. you take one beam, you extract it. Yeah. And he was mentioning collisions, but these collisions are between the beam of the SES and a target, a fixed target, which is a piece of something, a piece of metal around which they have built the experiment, whereas the LHC has collisions among two beams yeah. of protons. That's why it's a collider. So the next experiment we visited in the North area uh, was Compass, where Cristina has interviewed Fulvio Tessarotto from the experiment. Hello, we are now at the Compass experiment of the North area, and we have here Fulvio Tessarotto, the experiment spokesperson. Hello, Fulvio. Hello. Uh, so can you tell us what is Compass and what does it do? Does it guide us towards the North? Ah, yes, good joke. Actually, Compass does not guide us to the north, but it guides us inside protons and neutrons to understand what quarks and gluons, which are uh, the elements which compose protons and neutrons, do, how they move, what, is their, what are their characteristics, what are their behavior. So, for this, a group of almost 250 physicists has built a large apparatus and uh, uh, we ask CERN to provide us a beam which allows to make specific measurements inside protons and neutrons. So what happens when the SPS starts, when you get the beam? What do you do with it? We are very eager to receive the beam. It will be fantastic. It will be a, a muon beam of high energy. It is the only place in the world where this is possible. And with this beam, we will uh, shoot each of these particles of these muons in, inside the target. Uh, the target is very special, it will stay at very low uh, temperature, only 50 millikelvin above the absolute zero. And uh, it will have a large uh, magnetic field in order to keep all the deuterons which are inside aligned on the same direction. And this allows us to investigate uh, the properties of the components which are inside. You say that this experiment is very unique. How is it different? How is it special from the others? So, first of all, it is a fixed target experiment in the sense that we have a beam which we shoot against a target which is at rest which is in the laboratory, which is a big target. And uh, uh, this makes all products which come go forward. And this is why for 50 meters we have a sequence of detectors. This is very different from the collider experiment where detectors are one or all around. So in this sequence we have almost all detector technologies which are available and we pioneered the uh, development and the use of new technologies uh, for gas detectors, uh, for gem and micromegas and for other systems. You are saying that you are extracting muons from the beam. How do you do that and why muons? Muons are the heavy brothers of electrons. They are extraordinary particles. They can traverse uh, uh, meters of iron without problems, are the only ones which can do that. And uh, they have the uh, fantastic property of, put, of bringing enormous amount of energy inside uh, the, uh, the proton, inside the target. They are produced by shooting the protons from the SPS on a target and then uh, collecting uh, particles which come out, in particular pions, and letting the pions which have a short life decay. Uh, the decay product of the pions are mostly muons and they, these muons are then guided uh, by accelerator colleagues up to our target where we use them for our measurements. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And that was uh, Cristina, my colleague, with Julio Tesserato from the Compass Experiment. In the meantime, after the wonderful feat that you just accomplished, the acceleration of our first uh, proton beam into the SES with the new RF system, Karen Lee 
from SPS operations that just joined us. Thank you for joining us from the control room, which is not far from here. So, was it difficult? Yeah, this uh, has been quite a milestone for us. It's been non-straightforward, of course, with the uh, entirely new low-level RF control. Um, so quite a few changes, uh, new control systems. So um, we really had to set up everything from scratch um, and had a couple of difficulties. Also, we're using new algorithms actually to calculate optimal gains to bring us through the ramp. Um, it's all embedded in firmware, but okay, after, after some work, uh, we were very happy actually to see the beam go all the way through the ramp. And now it's uh, stably at flat top, 450 GeV. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> so that's that's quite nice. Well. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. No worries. <laughs> it's teamwork. This is a key word. Of term. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Kevin. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions for you. Stay with us. In the meantime, we're going to complete our tour of the experiments in the north area. We So the purpose of the NA62 experiment is to study rare phenomena and to search for uh, new physics beyond what we already know. And in the NA62 experiment, we study a, a charged particle K+, uh, which contained the quark strange. And uh, more specifically, we study a particular decay of this uh, particle that is uh, very, very special uh, because it's ultra rare, is very well predicted theoretically, and most importantly, is very sensitive to new physics, to new particles that, uh, that may exist. Uh, and so, because it's so well predicted theoretically, any deviation from the prediction will be a clear sign that there is something beyond what we know already. Uh, the experiment is very challenging uh, because we need to detect uh, the products, which is one charged pion and two undetected neutrino, and we need to reject anything else. And we observe these decays, but we need more data. To, be, uh, to finally pin down if there is a new physics or not. And indeed, with the new beam from the SPS, we, uh, we will be able to collect enough data uh, to decide if there is uh, indeed new particles present uh, in, uh, in this decay. Stuff. So the audience will be seeing pictures of the, uh, of the experiment here. Why is it so large? It's only 200 meters long. Yeah, it's of the order of 100 meters long because uh, the, uh, the charged kaons, so the, the particle that we study, um, are very energetic and also they have their own uh, lifetime, which is rather long. And so these two factors combined, it means that to be able to observe their decays, we need a very, very long experiment. Okay, well, Christina will be here to answer any questions for any success behind the computer, should be on the YouTube comments. You know, the computer. Any success for is it yes. to that the mysterious dark matter that we all know about? How does the experiment go about doing this? Uh, yes, so N64 is a fixed target beam dump experiment, uh, which is located at the H4 beam line at CERN. So what it does is it gets the electron beam from H4 and then looks for the sub-GEV dark matter candidate, which is the dark photon. So the dark photon is actually like a portal between the standard model part of matter and dark matter. So N64 is sensitive to the searches for the sub GV dark matter. Uh, until 2018, so before the long shutdown, N64 collected about 310 to the 11 electrons on target, and they were able to exclude a large uh, parameter space region for this dark matter particle. So for uh, this run, for after the long shutdown, the hope is either N64 can discover the sub GV dark matter or exclude the, all the predictive models in the low energy, in the lighter thermal dark matter region. Like you said, it's coming up to the end of the long shutdown too. Mm -hmm. Am I thinking that the electron beam will change to a muon beam? Uh, so they will continue with the electron beam, but they will also start to run with the muon beam as well. 
So with the muon beam and a 64 is sensitive to a larger mass region, so this would be quite interesting for it, for the dark matter search. And also recently we saw the results from Fermilab, which confirmed this anomaly of the muon G-2. So 64 will be sensitive to a massive gauge boson search, which can in principle explain this discrepancy as well. So this would be an interesting search for, with the muon beam for N64. She will be with Paula for the live Q&A, which is coming up next. And for now, back to you, Paula. So I think uh, for the SPS, it's the protons. I don't know if I need a mic. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, you need a mic. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yes, in the SPS, uh, the protons will be accelerated, and for the fixed target experiments, what is done is we take the protons from the SPS, then dump it against a target, and then we have a spectrum of particles that come out of this target. Then with many bends and quadrupoles, we can select the energy of the particle and the species of the particle that the different experiments will need, and we can send it to the different experimental areas as well. Yes. Yes. So we have. Yeah. Second question. Go ahead. So, official group of that are not in place right now regarding quantum computing, and how are you guys applying this? Is it a good idea? Do you want to answer, or are you Kevin? Okay. I I think I can say uh, about it. So, um, we've been looking. At quantum computing a little bit as a proof of uh, proof of principle experiment, if you wish, uh, what we're doing in the machine on our side is we're trying to automate certain processes to optimize actually the machine setup using reinforcement learning, and uh, we're doing this with uh, with classical machine learning techniques. But we've also recently got access to a quantum computer actually, and there we set up a little toy experiment to investigate a little bit and explore the potentials that we can get uh, using quantum computing for actually automated optimization of these accelerators. So that's that's oh. a bit what we are. But but we're more like the users, not really yeah, the it's a, the um. A toy experiment, I guess, a bit more complicated than the exactly. More questions. What is inside uh, a synchrotron? Is it just imagination? No, it's not imagination. It's very, very concrete stuff. But, uh, maybe Eric can tell us uh, uh, what is inside a synchrotron, the components of a synchrotron. So the components of the synchrotron, I would say these are magnets, these are beam vacuum pipe, these are RF cavities, these are beam positioning monitor, these are plenty of tools that we need to operate the machine. So no, it's not just imagination. These are real stuff that we have all around. <laughs> We can tell you it's even more nightmares than uh, than imagination. Huh? Uh, maybe uh, we can show again the images of the underground uh, with the RF cavities, uh, just to show you that it's absolutely real components we are talking about. We were there in the tunnel interviewing people. Next question. Uh, why do you, does it have to be the shape of a cavity? Can it be this much a cylindrical shape? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Why the cavity has that... Uh, the, 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 the shape is, is made such that the field applied to the particle in the center of the cavity is exactly where we need the field. So it's not a simple pipe, it's something that makes the field, the field inside the electromagnetic field inside the cavity at the right place, the right field. That's the shape of the various cavities that we have. Okay, Make that's it shorter. Very interesting. Thank you for the question. Next question How much energy it takes to accelerate protons at CERN? <laughs> okay, I never calculated that really. I can tell you that the uh, uh, protons are being accelerated to 450 GeV and uh, we have uh, 110 to the 11 uh, protons per bunch and we have 288 bunches, so I'll let you do the math. Um, <laughs> okay. so. so, yeah. What are you hoping to do with the result of this experiment? Speak for all the people, 
So uh, I can mention for NA64, so I, I spoke about it a bit. So with the new run, either NA64 hopes to discover the sub-GEV dark photon candidate, or it can uh, exclude all the predictive models for the light dark matter. Uh, Christina also mentioned for NA62 uh, th that they would require more statistics to uh, say for sure uh, that they have discovered the, the rare decay of the kaons. So I think all experiments are hoping for a positive result in the new run, but uh, for experiments like dark matter, just even a negative result is a is a good good thing because then we can exclude some of the models uh, yeah, from the searches. Is one of the most interesting history of contemporary physics, yeah. and whatever clues these experiments can give, even to the LHC, which yeah. is also one of the purposes of the LHC, and also its astrophysics and cosmology and even sure. the theoretical cosmology, they are all puzzled by the existence mm -hmm. of this matter that is there, but we can see it. How do yeah. we know it's there? Just to maybe to remind everyone, we know it's there. How yes. Do we do that? So dark matter we know from many cosmological observations. So when we look at the galaxy formations, when we look at the velocities of the galaxies, uh, we c we know that there is something there which interacts with our standard model matter via gravity, but nothing else because we cannot see it. So it doesn't interact with matter via any other form except via gravity. So from the effects of gravity on the standard model matter, we know it exists, but we don't know what the nature of this matter is. We know a lot about it. We know it exists. We know also where it is situated in, the in, in, in the galaxies. galaxies. Exactly. And we know there's more dark matter than normal matter. Yes. Which is way more. Yes. So we have 23% almost of dark matter and 4% of standard model matter in the universe. So no, yes, it would be nice. Yes. <laughs> and there are many experimental doing this. Exactly. Very, what is the second beam of the screen? Two colors. That is an intro or maybe a response? I think um, she means the magnet. Uh, the second beam on the screen. Uh, this beam probably. Uh, uh, this is uh, Ah, sorry. Yes, okay. So what you see here is an SPS super cycle. So we have several cycles played one after the other. Um, you can see the white curves. This is the magnetic fields of the bending magnets in the machine. Each time they ramp up and they come down is one cycle and all the cycles stashed together is what we call the super cycle. Now what you can see here is the first two ramp ups downs. This is a fixed target beam actually. Um, it's a, a slightly different than the LHC so this is really an uh, more or less unbunched beam coming into the SPS and uh, we accelerate this and use it to send to the um, to the fixed target experiments. It's like a continuous spill actually of protons that hits a target and produces the secondary particles uh, which we just heard of. And now you can see this vertical line enters the LHC type cycle. There are two of them, one after the other. And this one is actually for the LHC bunches which are the uh, 288 bunches ultimately that I spoke of before, which are accelerated, and those are sent to the LHC to do the collider experiments in the LHC. Right now we only have one bunch, okay, uh, ultimately, of course, we're going to have to accelerate 288 all until and send them over to the LHC. So that's the two different beams, if you wish, that you're seeing here. That was a really interesting question. It allows us uh, uh, to, to explain uh, the super cycle, which is quite complex, as you see. And if I can what is maximum level of detection? In your camera with the in the collision detector. So if you compare the detector to a camera, can you answer this uh, uh, little detail? So it really depends on. Sorry. Uh, it depends on the detector that you are using. So, for example, a tracking detector can have a resolution uh, for space. So how precisely we can detect the position of the particle on the, on the detector, and it can range between few microns to hundreds of microns after. Then you have the calorimeters, which detects the energy, and that has a different resolution as well. So yeah, it, it really depends on the kind of detector that, that we use for the experiments. What I can add is that the detectors, that are in particular the LHC, compared to cameras, they are super fast. Yes. Because they can take uh, like uh, 40 million yes. images yes. per second. Yes. And that no matter in the world sure. can do that. Yes. So, yes. How do you keep the particles on a circular car? Uh, yes, so uh, we do this with dipole magnets. Um, essentially, you just have particles flying through the magnet and then you have the, uh, the Lorentz force which kind of bends the, the particles and makes sure that they stay on a constant radius. So essentially that's... Uh
Uh, that's that's how you make sure that it doesn't go off orbit and bumps into the walls ultimately. So the Lorentz is another important force today. <laughs> I'm not made of force. Next question. Does this have any mechanism to promote the vacuum and the energy? Yes. Maybe we can talk about the industrial application of, uh, of accelerators. Uh, application to vacuum and energy saving. I don't know which of you, but I know that uh, what we do here is so extreme that industry is interested in to, to build the prototypes for us so that they can in fact we are maximum vacuum, maximum energy, and learn from right. You mean minimum vacuum? Minimum yes, we. Are. <laughs> I'm kidding you. Yeah, in fact we're working with, in close collaboration with the industry because all what we are doing, we need the support of the industry in order to be at the highest level as, as possible. What we need in the accelerator is at the top level of what they have in the industry. Then we have to promote the industry and the industry help us to do. This is the case with the big amplifiers. You can see this is done with Thales. This is not only a CERN business, this is in collaboration with industry. So we also try to minimize the losses, of course. So we try to be as efficient as possible in our amplifiers, for example. The same for the magnet, yeah. the grid power, etc. cetera. One example of energy efficiency is the superconductivity. Of course. We have of no course. losses in the LHC. It's a completely superconductive machine of 20 centimeters. And all the energy that is put into it uh, is used, and yes. there are no losses. Almost it, all. It consumes as much as the previous machine left, which uh, started in the 80s, and uh, and it was much older technology. And the LHC, it's uh, several orders of magnitude more powerful, but it does consume the same energy as the previous one. Mm -hmm. Thanks to superconductivity, which is here applied to the extreme. So, how long does it take to construct it, to construct the new RF system, I guess, maybe, Eric? So for the new RF system, we started 10 years ago, and it took the last five years to solve all the pro little details problem that we have in the amplifiers, passing through the phase of few fires. And then once we solved that, it took us two years to, to produce it in large series. So in fact, we did the first tower uh, within the first, let's say, five to seven years. And then all the towers have been made in less than two years, installed, tested, and being ready for the startup today uh, on due time. This, Somehow, yes. Yeah. Now it's yes. solid state. Is it, is it being applied uh, elsewhere in industry? I guess it will be applied in many laboratories because we demonstrated that we can do it on a large, large scale. And then plenty of laboratories will use that solution as well. But that's, tubes are not there. That's huh? how innovation happens. Yes. So, very you can know that what are the different particles being reached with the upgrade of the LHC? Uh, yes, so I'm more of a fixed target experiment, I'm not a collider yes. physicist. So for the LHC, I, I cannot much, but for fixed target experiments, I can say that, yes, uh, NN64, for example, is looking for the dark photon, which is the portal between uh, dark matter and standard model particles. So it, it acts like... A, a connection between the standard model and dark matter, if you will, and NA64 is looking for the hypothetical right. particles as well. Exactly. Dark matter and the LHC is looking for dark matter candidates. Yes. Yes. So the dark matter, uh, as we know, that exists in a diff whole range of masses. So depending on the reach of the experiments, one can probe different mass ranges for the dark and, matter. And this category of particles are called wind. Uh, uh, for N64, no, it's the light dark matter, right. but the WIMS are also one of the candidates for dark matter. Okay. Yes, yes, Which exactly. Means Massive particles. Massive yeah, particles. yes. In the events, what are you trying to find out now? <laughs> right. we are trying, at the moment, we are getting the machines ready mm -hmm. uh, so that they can do more discoveries yep. uh, starting uh, next year with Run 3, which starts uh, in May 2022, right? The first uh, being completed. So at the moment, we are getting everything ready. Mm -hmm. When are you starting? Because you have been yes. Here. So we, uh, for fixed target experiments, we will start uh, 12th of July, 2020. This yes, this year. So. Yes, until November, we have the fixed target physics uh, in the north area, and for the east area, it will start around uh, August or September, I think. Yes. And so the hope is to find out more about that matter for all these experiments. Also, there is N61, which is uh, QCD physics, compass QCD and physics. I very yes. Early about our yes. 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 Next question.
we've seen, uh, we've seen questions uh, going ahead. So I just want to ask uh, Kevin uh, what next, uh, now that you have accelerated the beam in the SPS. 240 GB using the new system, so this is uh, commissioned, let's say. Uh, it's, 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 it's partly commissioned, so um, you saw that we have two beams actually in the, uh, in the super cycle that you were just looking at before. So we have managed to accelerate the LHC beam. What remains to be done now is to accelerate the fixed target beam as well, uh, which is slightly more tricky because we need to cross transition. Um, and it's important for us to have both beams at top energy because we're going to use these beams to, to um, do the beam-based alignment. So we're going to have to calculate uh, the orbit corrections that are needed at flat top for the two beams. Then we'll turn off the machine and we're going to have to move magnets around to actually implement this orbit physically correction physically. Yes, yes, exactly. In the tunnel, yes. Okay. So to, to really make sure that our... She can start the physics in July. Exactly, exactly. But uh, I, I guess uh, you will be as successful as today. We did not know if it will work. It does work. So congratulations to everyone. Thanks uh, to all of you, especially the for letting us occupy the uh, yeah, like uh, the new relativity system uh, powering the system uh, uh, Thanks uh, to Martin, uh, who has done in the and uh, uh, for the super traffic for the system. Thanks uh, to all the big target experimenters that we've seen at the other one and, uh, and the different leaders that we will not attack us to all the viewers for your questions. Thanks to the technical team.